much of John's work has been uh, focused on the practical consequences of the last 25 years of the mixed but ever more socialist economy of Britain. And I think it's therefore particularly apposite that uh, he should address us today on the subject of the failure of the middle way. Ladies and gentlemen, I must apologize for being somewhat uh, late arriving here this morning, but uh, I live in the same block of apartments as Chris Tame, and I am deputed with the responsibility of feeding his cat while uh, he is running vast intellectual events down here. And this morning I forgot to feed it, and I had to go back from Waterloo Station, realizing that if I let his cat die, then <clears throat> I might not be getting my lunch here as well. Well, <clears throat> the entire session of this morning is really about uh, the issue of 1984 and the road to serfdom. And of course, this is the 40th anniversary of the uh, publication of Hayek's book on the road to serfdom. And as a small plug for our institute, I would like to point out that a an especially important book is being published by us very soon uh, called Hayek's Serfdom Revisited, uh, examining from a variety of angles, economics, politics, philosophy, what a number of modern thinkers and scholars uh, think about our situation now, whether we're still on the road to serfdom or not, or whether we're on a different road to that which Hayek envisaged and how we get off it and so forth. And my talk today partly comes from one of the essays in that volume, which will uh, appear under the name of Norman Barry et al. And I think you had Professor Barry speaking to you uh, very recently. Well, <clears throat> as I read Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom, it is not really primarily about the concept of the mixed economy or the so-called middle way. As I read Hayek's book, the majority of it is a warning about the consequences of comprehensive central planning. Uh, the main theme of the book is the argument that a comprehensively socialized economy involving uh, central planning must become totalitarian. And uh, a totalitarian society inevitably has certain other consequences. It cannot be democratic, uh, and also the worst tend to get on top. That, I think, in a, a nutshell, if, if you like, is one of the main themes in the uh, road to serfdom. Well, what is the relevance of that to our own situation? Because uh, if we did, uh, take Britain, uh, we have not had comprehensive central planning, apart from the war years when we had central planning uh, that was even more extensive than in uh, uh, Germany at the time, and we had central planning for some years after the war. But by and large, <clears throat> we've had a, a different sort of economic system in Britain over the post-war years, which we can call the mixed economy or the welfare state. And this has generally been true, has it not, of absolutely all so-called advanced Western countries. Uh, it is a complete folly, as so many uh, people do, to call uh, the Western economies capitalist or free market economies. Any country in which uh, the state takes uh, somewhere between 25% uh, and over 50% of national income, as is true of all the Western economies, cannot possibly be called capitalist. They might be called a mixed economy, but they cannot be called a capitalist economy. So we have, in a sense, in the Western world, followed a different path to the particular road to serfdom about which Hayek was speaking. Nevertheless, Hayek did have something to say about the, uh, the middle way in the road to serfdom. <clears throat> and, and he said this. He warned that it probably would not work very well. The mixed economy would not work well, and it might prove to be worse than the alternatives. This is what he actually said. <clears throat> he said, the idea of complete centralization of the direction of economic activity still appalls most people. 
not only because of the stupendous difficulty of the task, but even more because of the horror inspired by the idea of everything directed from a single center. If we are nevertheless rapidly moving towards such a state, this is largely because <clears throat> most people still believe that it must be possible to find some middle way between the atomistic uh, competition of the free society and central direction. Nothing indeed seems more plausible or is more likely to appeal to reasonable people than the idea that our goal must be neither the extreme decentralization of free competition nor the complete centralization of the single plan, but some judicious mixture of the two methods. I think that uh, insight of Hayek still provides us with uh, an understanding of much of the thinking that is going on today. Uh, <clears throat> It seems to so many people commonsensical that there must be a judicious balance between central direction and uh, the free society. <clears throat> and I think that is why uh, we have had a reigning economic philosophy and practice of the middle way uh, and the mixed economy throughout the post-war period in general. In fact, I might go on from that to say that the very idea of the middle way was not coined by some uh, social democrat. The very term the middle way was coined by a conservative politician, uh, Mr. Harold Macmillan, subsequently become uh, the Prime Minister of Britain for a uh, lengthy stretch of years in the post-war period, and now Lord Stockton. And he wrote a book published in 1938, entitled The Middle Way. And to give you some idea of the flavor of his views of what a middle way constituted, let me just give you a quotation from his book on the middle way. <clears throat> he says, the weaknesses of partial planning seem to me to arise from the incomplete and limited application of the principles of planning. The lessons of these errors, that is, of partial planning of the economy, which I regard as errors of limitation, is not that we should retreat. On the contrary, we must advance more rapidly and still further upon the road of conscious regulation. Now, that is the idea of the middle way as expressed by Harold Macmillan, who was in a subsequent position to put that program into effect for many, many years. Now, <clears throat> what I want to do in this talk is not to argue normatively about whether we ought to have um, a free society or the so-called middle way or uh, the complete uh, control of economic life by some supreme, in quotes, authority. I want to analyze, as an economist, how the mixed economy works. And I want to suggest that, firstly, we're, we have a situation in which we've lived under a regime of a mixed economy now for, let's say, roughly 40 years, yet we've got no decent economic theory about how the mixed economy operates overall. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that most economists are proponents of the middle way, but they don't, in fact, analyze how it works. And the second point that I want to uh, make <clears throat> is that according to the analysis which I'm going to suggest to you, the middle way or the mixed economy is a greatly unstable and indeed chaotic economic system. I think it more should be better expressed as the mixed up economy rather than the mixed economy. Now... <clears throat> oh. <laughs> The grounds on which I'm going to argue this uh, are not going to be uh, uh, great new theorems in economic analysis. I'm going to take the three most basic microeconomic laws of uh, political economy. And I'm going to say because of those three laws, and all of the evidence we have are that these three processes do exist in economic life in whatever context uh, we're looking at, and they cannot be bucked. 
the there. Now, I'm saying because of those three basic economic laws, this system is going to prove to be unstable. Those three principles are, firstly, that when there is a negative sum game between a number of contestants and there are a very large number of participants in the game, a situation known as a prisoner's dilemma emerges. The group can find no way of getting itself out of the negative sum game which depresses everyone's standard of living. Now we know from very many studies in politics and economics that the, where there are large numbers of people involved in that situation, they tend to be unstoppable. And the other two principles of economics which I'm going to rely upon are the first law of demand, that the higher the price of a good, the lower the quantity demanded, and the so-called second law of demand, that is the greater the length of time that people have to adjust to a price rise or price fall, the more flexibility they will have in their arrangements and the better they will be able to adjust to it. Now that, that's the simple basis of why I think the mixed economy will prove to be unstable. Now, <clears throat> let me start off by defining more carefully what I think the middle way or the mixed economy is. And I think the, the best typification of it, uh, the best description of it, was given not in fact by Hayek, but by his mentor and colleague, Ludwig von Mises, who pointed out in a number of his writings, including Human Action, the book Human Action, and his book on socialism, and various other writings, that really the mixed economy uh, was a system of what he called interventionism. He pointed out that the French had long had a term for this type of economic system, and they called it interventionism. Now, interventionism is an economic system in which, although voluntary arrangements between individuals remain uh, extensive, state regulation and intervention in the economy permeates virtually everywhere. That is the economic system of interventionism. Now, Hayek, in volume three of his Law, Legislation and Liberty, has analyzed how and why this system of interventionism comes about, and I largely support his analysis of that. <clears throat> he points out that <clears throat> we have widely adopted in Western countries the notion that democratic governments need be subject to absolutely no constraint in the exercise of unlimited powers except the right of the electorate uh, to vote the body of representatives. And it has been widely believed that this singular constraint, the power of general election, is sufficient to discipline uh, the possibly discretionary power of uh, representative governments. <clears throat> and it's possible to dispense with all other limitations or constitutional constraints on the behavior of government, except for this one principle that uh, the electorate has the right at some period of time to get rid of uh, the elected government and replace it with another. Now the problem, as Hayek points out, uh, with that philosophy is that if government has unlimited power to intervene, then it creates an incentive for groups to lobby for government to use that unlimited power on their own behalf. And so a system of incentives has been created within our political economy whereby all groups are given an incentive to lobby for government to use unlimited power on its own behalf. In a sense, as Professor Jensen has put it, in effect, a market in police powers has been created by the fact that government has unlimited power and uh, groups can lobby for uh, the use of that unlimited power. Well, in other words, the mixed economy is a system of interventionism. Now we can say something very simple about absolutely all types of government intervention. Um, and every type is subject to this observation. All acts of government intervention create a body of gainers and a body of losers. There are some people who gain from the intervention, they are net beneficiaries, 
and there is another group who are the losers from the intervention. Just to give some very obvious examples, government uh, regulation of air flights in Western Europe today aids state-owned industries, uh, state-owned airlines and their staffs. It harms consumers and tends to harm independent airlines. Uh, minimum wage laws help those people who retain employment at the higher wage. It damages the interests, typically, of those people who become unemployed as a result of the minimum wage set above market levels, and it also damages the interests, typically, of youths who cannot substitute uh, lower wages for on-the-job training. Uh, some people would also argue that it tends to have um, particularly concentrated effects upon the ethnic uh, composition of the war workforce. But again, there, there are gainers and losers. Again, any inflation, which is a form of government intervention under a fiat money system such as we have, any inflation creates gainers and losers. Uh, the gainers are the people who are net monetary debtors because the monetary value of their debt is reduced. Um, <clears throat> The losers are the net monetary creditors. And this, of course, is why government likes inflation so much. Government is always the largest net monetary debtor, but there are other groups in society who are also net monetary debtors. So, to point out, any type of government intervention of which we think, even including the provision of public goods, is going to create gainers and losers. The losers from the provision of public goods, for example, in the case of, let's say, uh, defense, are pacifists. Uh, the losers from the provision of public goods in the form of law and order are people like the uh, mafia, although they sometimes come to agreements with the state uh, police powers to <laughs> use them things for themselves. But in general, every gap act of government intervention means that there are a set of gainers and losers. Now, the point is that the two groups the gainers and the losers are going to react differently to the government intervention. The gainers from in any intervention are, on the whole, going to rather like it. Uh, it's uh, adding to their pockets or their utility or their security, and on the whole, they are going to enjoy that experience. The losers, quite obviously also, if they are aware of the burdens imposed upon them, are going to resent uh, the imposition of that burden and would prefer to be without it and would rather like to escape it. Now, this is all very, very common sense stuff. Every act of intervention creates gainers and losers and gainers and losers will react differently. Now, as a result of these very common sense and absolutely undeniable matters, I would argue that we are now witnessing the generation and have witnessed generation of the unleashing of two very powerful economic processes within the system of interventionism. And I'm going to label these two processes as follows. The first one I'm going to call the new Hobbesian process, and the second one I'm going to call the process of intervention entropy or intervention decay, however you like to call it. Let me speak briefly about the new Hobbesian process. Well, of course, it was the English political philosopher Thomas Hobbes in his famous uh, treatise published in 1651 entitled Leviathan who pointed out that selfish individuals acting in a state of nature, that is where behavior is unconstrained by uh, custom or framework of enforced law and custom, such individuals would be led to steal and plunder from each other leading to what he called a war of all against all. And from these considerations, Hobbes derived the case for an absolute sovereign power, the state, to enforce laws against coerced redistribution of goods and resources in order to end the war of all against all and to the general benefit. Now, I would argue that under the system of interventionism, or the middle way, or the mixed economy, we are witnessing a very powerful Hobbesian process of war of all against all at work. But it's a new type of Hobbesian process which has 
three distinguishing features from the process which Thomas Hobbes himself diagnosed so many centuries ago. First, the new Hobbesian process involves redistributionary struggles, not between individuals, as in the original Hobbesian analysis. Primarily, this struggle is are between highly organized groups. And it, uh, the groups involved include things such as the farmers, protectionist lobbies, trade unions. Uh, the NUM executive would be a fairly clear example of the sort of thing I'm talking about, but also professional associations such as doctors and lawyers, uh, lobbies such as the education lobby, uh, the healthcare industry in this country. Uh, we also have other groups who are not necessarily highly organized, but which are so large in number that from a voting point of view, it, uh, they constitute such important fiscal interest groups that government wants to curry their favor. Now, <clears throat> all of these groups under interventionism are seeking to uh, redistribute income or security towards themselves and away from other groups. And in other words, they're looking for the gains from intervention. They are rent seeking, as the economist puts it. They are trying to get these special privileges and protection which only the state can give by imposing harm upon others. But there are very, very large numbers of groups involved and it constitutes a sort of Hobbesian struggle of group economic warfare which even sometimes becomes military warfare, as we can see in the Midlands of Britain today. There is a form of civil war going on, and it is partly a Hobbesian struggle. Now, the second major difference of this new Hobbesian process is that it does not typically take place as a direct confrontation between the groups involved. Uh, the healthcare workers don't go out and beat up the teachers. Uh, the farmers don't go out and uh, steal from the uh, urbanites and the city boys. Typically, the way this uh, process, this new Hobbesian process takes place is through the political arena. And it takes place not as a di direct coercive struggle, as Hobbes envisaged. It takes place as the presentation of pressure upon government and bureaucrats and their agencies in order that government then will then use its coercive powers in order to redistribute income to the group in question. And it's only in particular cases as when British miners or French farmers surround ports and power stations uh, in order to block, uh, blockade them or to cause uh, public mayhem that we see this uh, Hobbesian process becoming an actual matter of physical confrontation. Now, the third feature of this Hobbesian process is that it cannot be cured by the Hobbesian device of an absolute power, the state. The reason is that the whole process is taking place within the state. The state is the arena in which the struggle is taking place. So therefore, the state cannot act as an outside body in order to suppress this Hobbesian struggle, as the state is the vehicle for it. And that leads on to something I'm going to be saying later about how to cure it. The answer, of course, is that the state must have its unlimited powers taken away from it by constitutional constraint. The way to stop it is to have something above the state that prevents it from getting out of line on behalf of all of these vested interest groups. <clears throat> now, the Virginia School of Public Choice Economists uh, have pointed out that this Hobbesian struggle uh, between all of these uh, groups is likely to be a negative sum game. It is likely to be a game, uh, a game which depresses the ability of the economy and the society to produce uh, productive goods and resources. Uh, simply put, more and more resources are devoted in this Hobbesian struggle towards uh, redistributing income. And if you're trying to redistribute income, you're not adding to it. Um, struggles that are simply of a redistributionary nature always tend to become negative sum as people invest more and more resources 
in trying to make sure the redistributionary gain doesn't go against them. Now, having said that, the um, political philosopher Professor Norman Barry, as recently appointed, has argued in a, uh, an article in the uh, journal Government and Opposition, he argues that this Hobbesian process is likely to reach what he calls a sort of like a high-level equilibrium. Well, there are many groups struggling against each other, but it doesn't topple over into a road to serfdom of complete totalitarianism and uh, one dominant group. And the basis of his argument is as follows. He argues that it's not going to pay the uh, public sector uh, goose, as it were, to destroy the golden egg of the private sector. It always pays to stop exploitation at some optimal rate of exploitation. He argues that the public sector will come to its senses before it destroys the private sector and the free market entirely, and it will stop at some stable rate of exploitation of the private sector. Now, I have to tell you that I think that is optimistic, both optimistic and wrong. It is wrong for the following reasons, and these are very basic and fundamental economic reasons why the hypothesis is not correct. Firstly, this vast squabble of interest groups, uh, which Hayek, by the way, calls the para-government of modern times, this vast squabble of interest groups does not constitute one homogenous and uh, undifferentiated unitary public sector. The fact of the matter is that there are very many groups squabbling with each other. If there was just one group, namely the public sector, which was trying to exploit the private sector, then yes, it is true. It would stop at some point which maximized its own interest. But even within the public sector, we have very large numbers of organized interests all operating entirely according to their own group interests. Uh, for example, the uh, National Union of Mine Workers Executive in Britain is not taking too much of a damn piece of notice of uh, the uh, non-striking miners except to send troops against them in order to beat them up and things like that. They are acting in their own selfish interests. They're not saying, oh, what will maximize the rate of return for the public sector as a whole, their interest in their own interests. So, and again, not all groups which are involved in this uh, redistributionary process are in the public sector. There are large numbers of groups such as private sector unions, trade associations, claimants unions, and lobbying consultants, all of which are operating nominally in the private sector but are trying to use the powers of the state to redistribute income towards their own clients. Uh, now, another reason why the Barry hypothesis is correct is that it would be impossible for all of these various groups in the para government to come to some sort of contract together to stop squabbling in the way that they are. They would never be able to enforce a stable and a police a contract of that sort. Just to imagine a contract to stop doing these things that would have to cover employers' associations, farmers, bureaucracies, quangos, uh, trade unions, is to realize it would be impossible for such a contract to be formed. So even if people can realize that they're in a negative sum game, it's impossible for them to come to a binding contract between themselves to stop the playing of the game. Now it is that which makes it a prisoner's dilemma that is, it's a situation of strategic interaction between the diverse elements of the para government, which <clears throat> means that all could be made better off if they stopped playing the game, but in which no particular contestant has got any interest in doing so. And therefore, it is a situation where there is a dilemma. Uh, it's impossible to stop the process from going on. So I, ca I cannot agree with Norman Barry that this is a process that will automatically stop at some point before we reach um, serfdom uh, under one dominant coalition. Now it seems to me that this conclusion lies, uh, throws some light on a number of contemporary developments. 
seems to me that over the past couple of decades, the Hobbesian struggle has been hotting up. Uh, trade unions in Britain quite clearly have been uh, moving towards more and more vicious forms of seeking to obtain uh, that which they want. And this has particularly been so in the public sector, uh, particularly in the white-collar part of the public sector. Uh, notions of professional ethics and professional norms have been thrown out of the window and typically today have been replaced by notions of very militant forms of uh, trade union activity. Another point that I, uh, I think uh, some, some light can be thrown on is what has happened to the so-called Thatcher and Reagan revolutions and the attempt to roll back the state while this Hobbesian struggle is going on. The problem, really, that uh, Mrs. Thatcher and uh, President Reagan face is not simply that they are not 100% libertarians. I'm quite sure they would like to go part of the way towards rolling back the state. I think they probably have some degree of gut commitment in that direction. But they face a profound political problem with this new Hobbesian struggle. The problem is that if any government which is of a reformist nature were to offend too many of the elements of the para government, were to harm too many sectional squabbling interests, then it would be possible for another uh, party to offer to restore the status quo ante in the next election and to buy the swing votes of other groups sufficient to give them an electoral majority. So the problem is that if you try to go too fast often in the face of reform, you could find that your ability to do so would be undermined by the ability of the elements of the para government to elect a different sort of government more conducive to their own interests. Right, well, I've talked about one of these processes. Let me briefly turn to the other side of the coin, which I've called the process of intervention entropy. Well, <clears throat> just as the potential gainers from any act of government intervention have got an incentive to employ lobbying to get the intervention and to get it reinforced, so losers have got the incentive to try to avoid the burden of any intervention. Now, in principle, losers could do that by themselves forming a lobby to counteract in the political market the weight and the pressure of the gainers from intervention. But the problem is that uh, interventionist governments have got very, very cunning about stopping this uh, counter-coalition formation of losers. The typical way that governments intervene is that they have an intervention which concentrates benefits narrowly on a section of the population, like farmers or miners, whereas the costs are spread by general taxation over everyone as a whole. Now, when the coalition of potential losers is so very, very large indeed, uh, covering vast uh, continental areas such as the size of the United States or Western Europe in the case of, let's say, uh, the case of farming, for example, and the redistribution going on in that, it's very difficult for the losers to form an effective coalition uh, to counter the force of the gainers in the political market. But what losers may, in fact, do is try to escape the burden of the intervention. Instead of trying to lobby against it politically, they might try to reduce the uh, cost of the burden imposed upon them. Now, here we come to the laws of demand. And just as the laws of demand apply to positively valued goods, the laws of demand also apply to bads, negatively valued goods. Now, the first law of demand applied to a bad, like having a loss imposed upon you by government, is that the greater the cost imposed uh, by any government intervention, the more that people will be willing to pay in order to avoid it. The greater the cost imposed, the more that people will be willing to pay in order to avoid it. So, for example, the greater the tax burden imposed upon an individual, then other things equal, the greater the effort that the individual will expand, uh, expend to try and avoid or evade the tax burden. The, the greater the uh, problems posed by an incomes policy or wage and prices controls, 
uh, the greater the incentive given for any firm or individual to try and get round the effects of the incomes policy. Now, secondly, over the longer run, as the result of the operation of the second law of demand, we should expect that individuals become better at avoiding and evading burdens they don't want than they would be in the short run. This is so for a number of reasons. Firstly, in the short run situation, when a burden is imposed upon anyone, they are subject to certain fixities in their stocks of capital. Uh, so, for example, if a tax is suddenly put on housing and people have housing, they might not necessarily be able to reduce their housing stock immediately without great cost. But over the longer run, they can reduce the number of fixities in their consumption patterns and try to move away from the burdens imposed upon them. Secondly, um, in the longer run, people have learning by doing, as the economist calls it. That is, to put, put the matter simply, the more that you evade taxes, the better that you get at doing it. Other things equal. The more that you avoid taxes, the more that you're used to fooling some government regulatory officer, the better other things equal you tend to be at it. A third reason why this uh, process occurs is that <clears throat> actually incentives are created for entrepreneurs to find ways of getting around uh, government burdens and offering these things as packages to individuals who want to escape it. It's partly an entrepreneurial process. Every day in the city of London, uh, not so far away from here, very large numbers of people are employed simply devising packages of tax avoidance and tax evasion which they sell to interested parties. So there is an entrepreneurial process going on as well which is underwriting this, this matter. Now why I call it the process of intervention entropy or decay is I'm saying the operation of losers um, which conform to the first and second laws of demand has an effect rather like the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics says that all matter is subject to increasing entropy and decay. Now, as a result of the attempts of people to escape the burdens of intervention, I think it's becoming increasingly apparent that intervention is subject to a process of decay and uh, decline. Now, I'm not suggesting that this occurs at the same pace in absolutely all spheres of intervention, and I'm not suggesting that it means that escaping the burdens of intervention is costless. Typically, if you want to go to a tax consultant, he's, want to go, he's going to want to rake off from the profits that you make from, from escaping certain taxes. Uh, nor would I suggest that this process occurs instantaneously. It takes a long time for people to find ways from escaping many types of intervention. But clearly, for example, this is happening in the areas of monetary policy, I would say that the entire history of the past 40 years is the slow realization that intervention entropy occurs in monetary policy. That is, you can try to uh, intervene through creating inflation in the economy, but inflation is a tax. And once people find that inflation is a tax, a tax on the holdings of money balances, the, this process of trying to escape it will start to take place and therefore the intervention will start to de decay in effectiveness. That effectively is the natural rate hypothesis of unemployment in economics. But of course this process also occurs in the incomes policy and the whole area of the black economy and the attempt to evade and avoid taxes. And I would also argue it occurs right across the whole burden of government uh, regulation and intervention. Well, let me come to my conclusion let me start to talk about the future of the middle way. I've argued that we have two major processes at work in the interventionist order, the middle way, the process of intervention entropy and the new Hobbesian process. What can we say about how these two processes will react, will interact in the future and what will come out of it? Well, one Thing I think we can immediately uh, say is going to be most unlikely. The likelihood that the middle way 
will prove to be a stable economic order in the presence of these two economic processes could only, that, that could only be a fluke. There is no automatic stabilization mechanism in the mixed economy which will return it to a stable and self-repeating order. If we define a stability, the situation that the system, when disturbed, will, ret will return to the same equilibrium, then I cannot see that the middle way is a stable economic order. There is absolutely no reason why the new Hobbesian process should exactly counterbalance, and in every sector of the economy, the process of intervention entropy. There is no uh, device which brings them into equilibrium. So the idea that the, the middle way is a stable economic order must be argued on the basis of the most simple and most general of economic propositions held by economic science to be a delusion. Well, if that is so, if the idea of a stable middle way is a fluke, what are the other possibilities? It seems to me that there are two main possibilities. In the absence of some major world cataclysm or some uh, vast change in the sets of ideas of people living in such systems. The first one is that the new Hobbesian process will prove to be the more stronger than the process of intervention entropy. In this case, governments will be led to weave ever more complex tangles of regulations, subsidies, special favours, leading to... <coughs> Uh, outpacing, if you like, the erosive force of the process of intervention entropy and eventually leading to such a morass of restrictions that there will be severe economic side consequences of that sort of order. Now, it seems likely to me in that event, if the, the new Hobbesian process is, is the stronger of the two, it seems like unlikely to me that majoritarian democracy would survive. I think the basis of the problem was put by Henry C. Simons also 40 years ago in his famous essay, Some Reflections on Syndicalism. He pointed out that organized economic warfare is like organized banditry, and if allowed to spread, must lead to total revolution, which will, on very hard terms, restore some economic order and enable us to maintain some real income instead of fighting interminably over its division amongst minorities. So yes, if this process intensifies and outweighs intervention entropy, it would seem likely to me that a dominant coalition will emerge in the process in order to damp the process down. So we could be on a road to serfdom through or via group economic warfare. The other possibility is that the process of intervention entropy will prove to be stronger than the process uh, that I've described as the new Hobbesian process. Now, in this alternative scenario, although the government would perhaps keep on trying to regulate the economy and would uh, perhaps even look as if it was extensive, it would in fact have uh, reduced ca capacity to run the economy because people had found so many ways around the controls uh, that government control, in fact, was rather weak. Now, it seems to me that this, in fact, has already come about in large part in both Italy and Peru. Uh, studies suggest that uh, in Italy, for example, about 30% of uh, Italian national income is in the fo form of income earned through the economia sommersa, the submerged economy, the black economy. Um, about 15% of Italian employees are, exist uh, are sorry, estimated to be in jobs that do not officially exist. The situation in Peru is uh, even more indicative of the sort of scenario that I'm talking about. Uh, a recent study by Hernando de Soto uh, discovered that two out of three workers in Peru are in the black economy. Two out of three. That included 90% of workers in the clothing business in Lima, 75% of, uh, of the furniture business, 60% of construction, and 95% of public, of public transportation. <laughs> now, so we are not necessarily talking about lunacy when we talk about intervention, entropy, and the black economy outpacing the new Hobbesian process. Evidently, in some places, it has become very, very extensive indeed. 
However, having said that, I think there is one, uh, a couple of worries about this rather more forthcoming Italian scenario, even though I do notice that uh, Italy, by the way, now leads the world in champagne and whiskey imports, and it's top of the league in second home ownership in Europe and in holidays, and it also puts more money into savings than any other country in Europe. It doesn't sound too bad in a way, but on the other hand, <clears throat> If one is going to exist in the black economy, and uh, most of the economy is going to be in the black economy, uh, productive activity has probably to be in rather small units. Uh, anything that was too obvious, like if you bought a, a black market um, automobile plant <laughs> involving 10,000 workers, you know, it's difficult to hide. And anything that was obviously too illegal and too offensive uh, that you couldn't bribe your way out of it, it might be difficult to sort of cover up. So what worries me about this Italian scenario is that although there would be extensive capitalistic and market economic endeavor, it would tend to be rather small scale and large capitalistic uh, endeavor might migrate from such areas to more happy abodes in say the, on the Pacifica rim of Southeast Asia and the countries of the middle way will have extensive black and grey markets, an extensive public sector, but no large-scale uh, capitalist enterprise, earning large economies of scale. Well, <clears throat> I think there is myself a fourth way, and that is that uh, we all change our ideas and become more <laughs> concerned with uh, the survival of liberty and also I believe it would be necessary to uh, have fundamental constitutional reform of government to prevent either of these two scenarios from coming about. But I think as things stand at the moment, uh, given the economic and political order that we've got, we can summarize the situation as saying that the middle way will prove to be a delusion and it will either become under the propulsive forces now embedded within it a road to serfdom through group economic warfare, or it will become a largely extensive black economy with no uh, guarantee that this will provide a happy home for large-scale capitalist endeavor, or that that could ever remain stable. Because remember that the Italian Communist Party is the second largest political party in Italy. I'll finish that point. And, uh, <laughs>